Hello everyone, my name is Tim and this is the CircuitPython weekly meeting for December the 12th, uh, 2022. This is the time of week where we get together to talk about all things CircuitPython. Uh, uh, again, my name is Tim. I'm sponsored by Adafruit to work on CircuitPython. CircuitPython is a version of Python that's designed to run on tiny computers called microcontrollers. The development of CircuitPython is primarily sponsored uh, by Adafruit, so if you want to support Adafruit and CircuitPython, consider purchasing hardware from Adafruit.com. This meeting is hosted on the Adafruit Discord server. You can join anytime by going to adafru.it slash discord. We hold a meeting in the CircuitPython dev text channel as well as the CircuitPython voice channel. This meeting typically happens uh, on Mondays at 2 p.m. Eastern Time, 11 a.m. Pacific Time, except when that coincides with the U.S. holiday. Uh, in the notes document, there's a link to a calendar that you can view online or add to your favorite calendar app. Uh, we'll also send notifications about the upcoming meetings uh, via Discord, so if you'd like to receive those notifications, um, you can ask us to add you to that CircuitPythonistas uh, Discord role. And I'll mention it again at the uh, wrap-up, um, but uh, just a heads up, next week's meeting is normal time and date, and then the following week, uh, I believe, is the week we are off, and then the one after that is when we have the uh, change to the Tuesday, just like this was saying. Uh, for the U.S. holiday. So uh, upcoming scheduling, uh, if you need reminders, uh, take a look at that calendar linked in the docs. Uh, speaking of the doc, uh, the notes document to accompany the, uh, excuse me, there is a notes document that accompanies the meeting. This is a Google doc. Um, this is pinned in the Discord channel if you need to get access to it. The notes document contains timestamps that go along with the video. So you can use the document to view only the parts of the video that interest you most. The meeting tends to run 45 to 60 minutes, so this gives you the option to skip around. Um, uh, after each meeting, we post a link to the next meeting's notes document uh, in the CircuitPython dev channel over there on the Adafruit Discord. Check the pinned messages to always find the latest notes doc, um, and you can always add your notes to that uh, throughout the week as well. So once that gets pinned, uh, the new one is created following the meeting, you can of course add your notes for next week uh, starting whenever that's up. Um, so go ahead and do that throughout the week if you like. Um, the meeting structure, so the meeting is going to be held in five parts. The first part is going to be community news. This is going to be a look at all things CircuitPython and Python on hardware in the community. The preview of the Python on microcontrollers newsletter. The second part is the state of the circuit, uh, excuse me, the state of CircuitPython, the libraries, and Blinka. This is a statistical overview of the entire project. It's a chance to look at the project by the numbers, separate from what we're all up to. The third part, and the first of our two round robins, is the Hug Reports section. Hug Reports is an opportunity to highlight the good things folks are doing. Uh, take some time to recognize uh, folks in our community and beyond for good stuff that you have seen them uh, do. The fourth part, uh, and the second of our two round robins, is the Status Updates section. Uh, during status updates, this is an opportunity to sync up on what you've been up to for the week. Take a couple of minutes, uh, tell us about what you've been doing since uh, the last meeting for the last week and what you uh, plan on doing for the next week until the next meeting. The fifth part uh, and final part of the meeting is In the Weeds. In the Weeds is an opportunity for more long-form discussions. These discussions can come out of the status updates or they can be stuff identified ahead of time as too long uh, or in-depth for status updates. So if you've got topics for In the Weeds, go ahead and scroll uh, down to the bottom of that doc and get those added just as soon as you come up with them. And then uh, we'll go over whatever topics are there um, to close out the meeting. So that covers how the meeting uh, will go. So first up, we are going to look at community news. Uh, so let me get there and get a timestamp for us. And first in community news this week is the uh, CircuitPython 8.0.0 beta 5 was released. Uh, so beta 5 has been released. It's relatively stable, but there will be further additions, fixes, and changes before the final release. Uh, there are links here to the Adafruit blog as well as uh, GitHub if you would like to check out the release notes or anything else related to that new release. Uh, please do, uh, if you have projects and things that run CircuitPython, please do try out the new release if you have a chance and let us know um, over on Discord or in issues or somewhere on GitHub if you have trouble um, uh, with any particular project. And of course, thanks to, to the folks who uh, will try that out for us um, and an early uh, hug report thanks to uh, Dan for making the new release. 
Uh, next up in community news, we've got a video interview with Guido Van Rossum. Uh, this is titled Python and the Future of Programming. Um, a recent interview by Lex Friedman, uh, Guido Van Rossum, Python and the Future of Programming. And there is a link here to watch that interview over on YouTube. So check that out if that sounds interesting to you. Uh, next up is a Korg synthesizer that uses uh, a Raspberry Pi. Um, this wave, uh, excuse me, uh, this is the wave state synthesizer. Uh, Korg uh, created this device and showed it. Uh, it's a spiritual successor to the legendary wave station synthesizer from 1990. This device was first um, on display at NAMM last month. Uh, according to information from sonicstate.com, the WT hardware, uh, WaveState hardware, is based on a Raspberry Pi. Uh, and there is a video that's linked here in the doc, as well as the newsletter for this week, that shows uh, somebody taking apart one of these devices. Uh, and indeed, it does look like a uh, Raspberry Pi uh, compute module is in there. So that's definitely super cool to see that. Um, next up in community news still, this is uh, tutorial pages on the Adafruit um, learn system or user pages, I, I should say. So a uh, relatively recent feature added to the Adafruit learn system is the ability to create user pages. This is a new way to add your own content uh, for make, uh, this allows you to use the same technology that are in the Adafruit learning system uh, to publish your own tutorials and guides uh, on the internet. Uh, this week highlighted in the newsletter are some user pages created by uh, community member Joey Castillo. Uh, and in particular, it is a uh, NeoPixel powered Christmas tree that has an Adafruit LCD Featherwing. Uh, there's an implementation of a one button UI for scrolling it to turn on and off. Uh, and it uses the, uh, excuse me, it uses the CircuitPython's uh, deep sleep feature to save as much powerful, uh, ugh, excuse me, to save as much power as possible uh, when the tree is in the off state. And there are links here to Mastodon as well as those user pages uh, on the learn site. Uh, and then uh, two more uh, items in community news surrounded out. These are a couple projects from the week, uh, a couple things that caught my eye. The first one is a, a bit of a wacky keyboard, which I'm always uh, kind of a sucker for. This is uh, titled the Ultimate Unicode Input Device. Uh, it has 18 uh, physical switches, which you can flip on and off, which represent 18 bytes of binary and then a single send button. So you flip your sit, uh, switches to indicate ones and zeros for a, uh, you, uh, you know, a binary representation of a Unicode character, and then you press your button to actually send it to the computer. So I thought that was a really funny, uh, interesting thing. There's links there to Adafruit blog as well as Hackaday, uh, and there are videos of that in action if uh, that's the kind of thing that you find amusing like I do. Um, and the last one uh, this week, which I also uh, couldn't bring myself to uh, to not put in here, was a barcode clock using the Pimeroni Badger 2040 uh, that runs with MicroPython. So this is a fast updating e-ink display, and this person uh, who has posted uh, information about this to Twitter has created a clock which simply just cycles through the seconds of the day. Uh, but the nifty part about this is it also displays the time as a barcode. So if you scan the barcode at any given second, uh, it will tell you what time of the day it is. So this is kind of interesting to watch the time tick by and see how it uh, affects the barcode. So um, lots of great stuff. All of these items and many more uh, came from the uh, newsletter, uh, which I will timestamp for that as well and then tell you about this is all from the circuit python weekly newsletter it's a uh, community run newsletter that's emailed every tuesday the complete archives are available on adafruitdaily.com it highlights the latest uh, in python on hardware related news from around the web including circuit python python and micropython developments uh, to contribute your news or projects, you can either edit next week's draft on GitHub, uh, submit a pull request with your changes. You can also tag a tweet with hashtag CircuitPython on Twitter or email to cpnews at adafruit.com. And of course, thank you to uh, our very own Ann B for collecting all of these great things for us to look through each week in the newsletter. That gets us to the end of community news. And next up, it will be the state of CircuitPython, the libraries, and Blinka. Uh, let me get to the right spot in my doc here. So uh, this is a quantitative overview of the entire project. It's going to give us a chance to look at the health of the project separate from what we're all uh, up to. We'll talk about the project overall and then separately discuss the core, the libraries, and Blinka. 
So first up, I will tell you about the overall stats for this week. Uh, this week, across all CircuitPython projects, we had 23 uh, pull requests merged from 17 authors. Uh, a couple of the authors whose names um, I don't recognize as being frequent contributors, perhaps these folks are newer or less frequent contributors, uh, or perhaps uh, I could just be mistaken, but those names uh, this week that stood out to me were uh, S-OL, uh, Evil Dave 666 Pontus O, uh, Boren Roni, uh, Kassane Ho, uh, Boolean Matok, and Vladak. Um, those were the names, again, of folks that might be newer or less frequent contributors, so uh, thank you to them, and of course, thank you to all the rest of our more regular contributors as well. Um, for those uh, 23 pull requests, uh, there were seven reviewers um, in there, so those do look like all the usual suspects. So thanks, of course, to our uh, normal reviewers, members of the team here. Appreciate all of those folks, as usual. Um, we had in issues, there were 18 issues closed by nine people, uh, with, uh, with 18 opened by 14 people. So net even on issues, uh, but they are churning. We're getting opens and closes uh, to keep stuff moving. So this is all good. Uh, next up, I will hand it over to Scott to tell us about the core, if that's all right, Scott. Sure. Thanks for running the meeting, Tim. And I scrolled right by it. Uh, for the core, <laughs> we had 16 pull requests merged from 13 different authors. So thank you to all of our authors. Um, Boolean Matic, Pontius O, our Bor and Roni are all look, look like new names to me. So thank you to those folks. We had three reviewers. So we're always looking for more reviewers. Um, we have 19 open poll requests, and drafts are now marked, so thank you. I believe Tectric did that. Um, if I'm wrong, please correct me. Um, so we have 19 open poll requests, 8 are drafts, so we have 11 open that are non-drafts, um, which is pretty good. And the oldest two are about 300 days old, so we should take a look at those and uh, figure out what to do about them. Um, issues wise for the core, we had 13 closed issues by five people and 11 opens by 10 people. So again, we're kind of, <laughs> Dan marked the drafts by hand, uh, this time at least. Um, so thank you to all of the folks that are involved in issues. We have a total of 578 open. Um, we categorize those to, to prioritize for the Adafruit funded folks that work on CircuitPython. Um, and we have zero open issues for 7.3x, which means 7.3.3 is pretty good. Um, and uh, we have 13 open issues on 8.0, which is uh, significantly down from the 20 plus that we had last week. So that's been really good and making lots of progress on 8.0, which is good and hope to have it out in January. And then we have 508 open long term issues as well. Um, three don't have a milestone, so those are the ones that we uh, will need to take a look at and categorize. So that's it for the core. Excellent. Thanks, Scott. Um, and next up will be the section covering the libraries. Uh, ordinarily, this section is uh, read by Katni, but she was unable to join us today, so I'll read the libraries section. Um, so this section covers all uh, libraries, which are hosted on GitHub under the name of Adafruit underscore CircuitPython underscore, and then there will be a library name following that. Um, these are all the Python layer of code that allows CircuitPython to interact with various different pieces of hardware, sensors, um, and things of that nature. Um, this week in library land, we had seven pull requests merged by five authors. A couple of those same names that I mentioned before look like newer contributors on the uh, library side of things. Um, and then for those seven pull requests, we had six reviewers this week. Uh, and again, those do look like the usual suspects. So thank you to all of our authors and reviewers for the week. Um, other stats in library land, we did have, uh, we, we do have, I should say, uh, 42 pull requests that are open. Uh, over the week, we had five closed issues by four people with six uh, opened issues by four people. There are currently 589 open issues. Uh, of those, 97 are marked as uh, good first issues. 
Um, and to go along with that, I will mention, uh, if you're interested in getting involved with uh, development, the libraries is one of the best, uh, most easiest places where you can do that. Um, there is a website dedicated just to that. If you go to circuitpython.org slash contributing, uh, there's all sorts of information there about um, how to contribute and what kinds of things you can start uh, working on if you do want to contribute. Um, if you're interested in this information and more, check out that page at circuitpython.org slash contributing. You'll find all the open pull re uh, excuse me, all the open uh, PRs as well as open issues and a list of library infrastructure issues. Uh, if you're looking to contribute, that's a great place to start. The issues can be sorted by label, so you can search for good first issue uh, if you're just getting started, or uh, if you are a bit um, beyond the basic steps, you can also filter those on bug or enhancement. Um, if you uh, need help, there is a guide for contributing with uh, Git and GitHub. So we're always happy to help folks that want to get started. Uh, if you do need help beyond what is in the guide, you can always um, join us on Discord and ask for help there. There's plenty of folks uh, who are always willing to help uh, folks contribute. So if that is something that you think you'd like to do, um, please uh, do get involved. We're definitely happy to always see new folks coming on board. Uh, and so that is it for the library section. Next up is the section covering uh, Blinka. Um, and I also, I don't see Melissa in there, so I'll read the Blinka section. Let me get scrolled to there. Oh, uh, we do have the PyPies. I already passed it up. I'll do my timestamp and do Blinka. Um, we'll do the PyPy stats next week for the libraries. I forgot those, that one's on me. Uh, for Blinka this week though, we did have uh, no action in uh, Blinka land, zero pull requests merged. Uh, by zero authors and zero uh, reviewers. There are 10 open pull requests, um, including a couple newer, looks like a few of those are about 10 days or so old uh, in terms of the Blinka PRs. Um, across the all the Blinka issues, there were zero issues closed by zero people for the week and one new issue opened by a single person. There are 87 uh, current issues open across Blinka. The uh, PyPy downloads for the last week for Blinka are 22,598, and then the PyWheels downloads for the last month are uh, 7,327. Um, and there are 100 boards currently supported by Blinka. So hip hip hooray, uh, we just crossed the 100 board milestone for Blinka. So that's very exciting. Um, and that brings us to the end of the status update, or excuse me, the um, uh, status report section, um, which gets us to the first of our two round robins, the hug reports section. So hug reports, to reiterate, this is a chance uh, for folks to highlight um, members of the CircuitPython community and beyond for doing awesome things. I'll start and then we'll go down the list alphabetically or as names appear in the uh, notes document. We'll give everyone a chance to participate. If you're text only or missing the meeting, but you have some hug reports, um, go ahead and note those in the document and I'll read them as we get to your turn in the list. Um, so I will start out this week with hug reports. Let me get a timestamp here. Uh, my hug reports for this week, thank you to C. Grover, uh, who published uh, some helpful colorful, uh, excuse me, color utilities in the community bundle a while back uh, and shared some example code that uses those to create some interesting gradients uh, this weekend in the Discord, as well as uh, showing how to integrate those with vector IO shapes. I think there's lots of interesting stuff uh, possible uh, based on some of these examples that C. Grover has shared, as well as the utilities that they made. So thanks for that. Um, uh, also, Hug Reports this week, thank you to uh, Dan, Jeff, uh, and anybody else putting work, uh, hard work into the Get EMV effort. Um, definitely really appreciate all the effort that's going into that. I think that's a really good um, you know, move forward for us uh, with accessing secret variables. So thanks to all the folks working on that. And then um, last one for me this week is a group hug. So next up, I will uh, pass it over to C. Grover, if you want to tell us your Hug Reports. Yeah, first I'd like to thank Katni and, and you, Foamy Guy, for recommending PyCharm. I was kind of a stubborn converter from Adam, and since they pulled the rug out from under us, then I had to move to PyCharm. But the documentation for the setup and usage really made a big difference. It took me about a week to get used to PyCharm, but I've seen improvements in my workflow already, so thank you for that. I would like to recognize DJ Devon for... Um, some of the innovative work that he's been doing and openly discussing and documenting it, he's doing some pretty cool stuff. And uh, I like looking at his innovation and the artistic approach that he's taking. Uh, again, to Foamy Guy for uh, thought-provoking sessions. 
the stream to build gradient color fills for display IO shapes helped me to break some log jams in my concepts um, for the approach I was taking on the palette slice wrapper project. So thanks. Nice. That is great to hear. Thanks, C. Grover. Uh, next up, I will pass it over to Dan. Okay, thank you. Um, so over the weekend, uh, we started seeing a, a continuous integration problem on GitHub Actions, which was kind of confusing. And I'd like to thank Microdev and Jeff for working on this over the weekend, or at least taking a look at it. And Microdev proposed several fixes for it as well. Um, it was hard to understand. Thanks to Jeff, who's been working on uh, OS.getInv kind of over and over again, revising it some of the time because I brought up some ideas. So thanks for your patience with my suggestions. And thanks to Katni, um, a GitHub security issue came up and we had to deal with it. And Katni and I uh, kind of split up the responsibility for that. So thanks to Katni for that. Okay. All right, thanks, Dan. Uh, next up is DJ Devin3, who's text only, so I'll read their hug reports. Um, uh, following that, actually, is D Gloud, who's text only as well, which I'll read in the next one. Uh, if you want to get ready, will be Jeff. Uh, you'll be after these two that I read. So uh, back to DJ Devin3 first, though. Uh, hug reports from DJ Devin to uh, Katni uh, for an excellent Mastodon API guide. Hug report for Liz for hosting show and tell uh, for her awesome vlog on. Uh, and for her awesome vlog on modular uh, MIDI music melody maker. Uh, hug report for Foamy Guy, me, uh, for teaching new things uh, every week. Um, the learning never stops. And then uh, last one from DJ Devin3 is a hug report for Jeff uh, for excellent chat GPT demo uh, in CircuitPython on last week's show and tell. Uh, next up is... Uh, David Gloud, let me get a timestamp, who is text only and has a group hug for everybody. Uh, and now I will pass it over to you, Jeff. Hello, where's that other mute button? Um, I have a group hug and I want to thank Dan for patiently working through the Giddy and V changes with me. I guess we were both being super patient with each other during this time. <laughs> uh, it's been a bit of a slog, but we'll get it done soon. And that's what I have. Thank you. All righty. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, next up is Katni, who is missing the meeting today. Katni has a hug for Maker Melissa for helping with a really difficult pinouts page in an upcoming product guide. Uh, helped, uh, looks like Melissa helped out with initial info, uh, went over it, and made further edits as needed to make it solid. Uh, hug report again from Katni. This one's to Liz for being a great partner in uh, crime, or maybe not crime, but learning, uh, and for always being able to answer questions and for me to bounce ideas and things off of. Uh, a hug report. Um, uh, well, Katni mentions, as always, uh, cer I'm certain that I'm uh, forgetting folks. Uh, so, of course, thanks to anybody who may have been um, forgotten, not listed here, and they group hug for everyone. So, thanks to Katni for those. Uh, and next up is Scott. Hello. Uh, first, a hug report to Microdev for helping me get the ULP going. I had basically like given up on getting it working, and then Microdev gave me an example that worked, and I figured out what my problems were with my example. So thanks to Microdev for giving me that little push and getting me over the hump on getting the ULP going. I think it's a kind of a neat thing, so I'm, I'm kind of excited about it. Um, ULP is short for the ultra low power processor on the ESP32, S2, and S3 chips. Um, there's also one on the ESP32, but it's not a RISC-V core, which is more interesting to me. Um, thanks to Jeff Blur for tom tomolifying the environment settings. Uh, and a uh, hug report to Anik Data for further NDNS testing. I know that I've been kind of ignoring all that stuff, but uh, I do appreciate Anik Data really living on the edge and, and pushing it to its limits and, and documenting where it falls over. Uh, so that's it for me. All righty. Thanks, Scott. Uh, next up in rounding out the hug reports is Tectric, who's text only, so I'll read. Uh, this week, Tectric has hug report for Paul Cutler for having uh, Tectric on the CircuitPython show, uh, talking about continuous integration and CircuitPythonica project. Uh, and a second thanks for letting me record, uh, letting me re-record part of the podcast for accuracy. Uh, and then a group hug. So thanks to Tectric for those. 
Uh, and do be sure, um, I don't think it was mentioned anywhere else, but do be sure to check out that uh, version of the podcast, which was released, I think, even earlier today, perhaps, with Tectric on there. Um, so that rounds out the hug reports. Uh, next up will be the status updates. Uh, so as a reminder, status updates is our time to sync up on what we're doing. Um, take a few moments to tell us what you've been working on since the last week, uh, last week's meeting, and what you'll be working on until next week's meeting. Uh, this is a good opportunity to provide tips and tricks relevant to what people are working on. If a discussion because does become too much or too long, we can always move it down to uh, in the weeds section. So this is another one of the round robin sections. I'll begin, and then we'll just go down the list as the names appear in the notes doc, uh, which should be uh, mostly alphabetical, but uh, we'll just follow the doc even if it's not quite. So first up, uh, my status updates for the week. Um, I uh, last week worked on uh, MPY building a specific branch from a, a library PR, uh, which requires a couple of tools to be set up and running. I didn't have those in my new environment uh, yet, so I kind of got myself back up and running to be able to build those MPR files, excuse me, MPY files. Um, specifically, I was attempting to test a PR for the Ethernet uh, library. There was something in there that I I think I had seen in the past maybe uh, behave differently in MPY, so I wanted to make sure to test it in a actual compiled one rather than just the Python one. Um, so I got that all set up and did the testing uh, last week. Um, uh, last week I also implemented the set root group functionality inside of Blinka Display.io. So this is a recent API change in, in the core, and I have now put out the PR to update Blinka to behave the same as the core now does. And then uh, the other stuff that I was getting into last week uh, is a bit of learning about color theory and adapting some C Python code that I found that generates uh, gradients to work with CircuitPython and Display.io. Um, there were both linear and polylinear gradients um, on the page uh, that I found. Both of those are implemented and working in CircuitPython. I just put them in a basic bitmap for now, but I think there are other interesting ways you could make use of them uh, once you've got your palette generated. Um, the last one, which was in that resource, was called a Bezier curve um, gradient, and so I want to work on implementing that one this week and converting it over to CircuitPython so that we can use it, um, and then put some time into figuring out the best way to share what I've come up with. I think it's um, Display.io is kind of the primary thing that I'm intending to use it with, but I think uh, possibly it could have other uses, like maybe NeoPixels or other situations where you could be outputting color. So uh, fun stuff going on there all the way around. Um, and then I don't necessarily know what I'll be getting into beyond that for the week. So that's all I've got this week on status updates. So uh, next up, I will send it over to C. Grover. Well, let's see. I've been working on a palette slice wrapper class that uh, talked about last week a little bit. That's the um, a class that will take a display I.O. palette and treat it more like a list so that you can do um, inserts and um, and deal with things like slice objects so that you can manipulate the palette just like you would with a list. So um, this week's progress was including transparency content along with the color content. So um, the next thing to do with that, though, would be to look at some of the functionality that may be needed to make it look even more like a list for append and insert and extend and some of those extra functions. So I'm about ready to make the alpha repo public, but I want to do some additional tests so I won't be embarrassed when I release that. <laughs> anyway, I'll post a link to a demo that shows the um, uh, an image that was um, that has a, a, a palette of about 256 colors and no transparency, but it runs through a bunch of random slices of it and, and gives a pretty good example of how well it works. And then uh, I've got a side project that I'm working on out in the workshop to duplicate a broken wind chime that we have. And uh, it's something that, that was in my wife's family for quite a few years. And it's uh, something that is, it makes a lot of noise in the neighborhood. So we certainly want to get it back up on the back porch. Can make it stronger, going to make it brighter than it was in terms of the, the colors and materials. But the best part is going to be selecting the tune that it's going to play. And so I was thinking about classical music or something in a major key. And uh, I think we may use something in a minor key just to scare the squirrels away, something like that. 
a friend of mine um, suggested that we tune it to play Happy Birthday, but I think there may be a city ordinance against that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, C. Grover. Sounds like a, quite the interesting project for sure. Um, next up is Dan. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, so last Wednesday, I released CircuitPython 8.0 Beta 5, um, which had like more than 80 pull requests in it. Um, I'm going to do try to do Beta 6 quite soon because it'll have the incompatible the changes. We're changing .env to a kind of a restricted subset of TOML to be settings.toml. Uh, for various reasons, including that it's really hard to create files that begin with a dot on a couple of different operating systems, and also to make the syntax be a little more a little more like Python in terms of quoting and things like that. Um, meanwhile, I've been just working on 8.0 bug fixes. Um, I investigated some bugs. Some are no longer problems. Uh, so I, I just closed them. Some were pushed, I pushed to 8xx or later because they don't need to be fixed for 800 or can't be fixed for 800. I fixed a couple of minor ones and I've got some other ones in the works, working on some things and also awaiting hearing from the um, original posters. We are now down to 13 issues, as was mentioned earlier, which is terrific. That really looks a lot more like the light of the end of the tunnel compared with the 30 that we had a few weeks ago. So I also, besides fixing those bugs, I've been reviewing uh, other folks' PRs, making some suggestions on those. And I wrote up uh, an issue that we're having with the uh, continuous integration, as I mentioned in Hug Reports. Uh, I didn't fix it, but Marco, Dev, and Jeff are working on fixing it. OK. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you, Dan. Yeah. Uh, next up is DJ Devon, who's text only, so I'll read. Um, DJ Devon says, showed off the Cutie Pie parent BFF on show and tell. Uh, it's a great little grounding board for LED, LED projects. Uh, found some more problems with the TR cowbell and beta testing. Uh, yeah, and beta testing shipments are going to be delayed from that. Uh, Stemma QT port doesn't work, so. Uh, not going to bother soldering the connector to the boards. Um, DJ Devon did confirm that I2C works. Uh, there's a workaround for using I2C on pins 10 and 11 only, uh, which is not what they had in mind when designing it. Um, got an Ender S3, uh, excuse me, Ender 3 S1 Pro 3D printer. Uh, so DJ Devon got 3D printer going this week. Started designing an orange cap for the Adafruit step switches. Uh, it took seven iterations before getting one that fits and works right. Uh, I'm now thinking about designing my own step switches from scratch uh, that are more like the original TR-808 switches. Uh, the step switch model I got from CAD Parts doesn't have functional, uh, doesn't have a functional switch mechanism. Specifically, it's mis uh, missing the center nub that presses the switch. Uh, so be aware that it's a cosmetic, cosmetic only 3D file floating around for, uh, excuse me, which is fine for adding to PC, PCB designs for a 3D view, uh, but not for 3D printing, of course, if you're expecting to actually be able to use it. Um, redesigning it into a working version that's not just cosmetic, uh, hoping to PR the working STL file in Adafruit's CAD parts uh, GitHub this week. The first thing I've ever designed for a 3D printer. This was the first thing I've ever designed for a 3D printer. So cool. Uh, DJ Devin getting involved in uh, some 3D modeling this week for the first time. Uh, and then the uh, there is a picture of the component if anybody's interested in the image of that 3D model. Uh, and then the last bullet point here for um, status updates for DJ Devin says switching back and forth between learning Fusion 360, uh, 3D printing, and designing the modular TR Cowbell version 1.3 using SMD components. It's been a busy week. All right, uh, next up is uh, David Glode. I believe I said that right, but if not, uh, I apologize, and I'll have to ha have you remind me, but I know you told us a couple of weeks back, so hopefully I got that one right. Uh, David uh, this week says... Uh, for this week, uh, gave a Gemma M0 mouse jiggler to a coworker. Uh, maybe they'll try to adapt it uh, to CircuitPython code. Uh, installed CircuitPython on my new Lowland boards, the C3 Mini versions 1 and 2.1. Uh, 
the S2 Mini, the S3, and the S2 Pico, uh, which has got a 128 by 32 OLED display. Uh, testing some new accessories, uh, 32 by 64 OLED, uh, proposing a PR to add support for 32 by 64 OLED inside the DisplayIO SSD 1306 library, uh, and there's a link to a PR there. Uh, making a Lego dumb terminal for the 32 by 64 screen, uh, and there's a link to an issue there, um, which I will definitely check out later. I'm getting interested in Lego, so that seems kind of cool to me. Uh, for next week, David says, uh, try to apply Adafruit 5x5 NeoPixel Grid BFF Learn Guide to the 8x8 RGB Shield uh, to scroll text like Liz and Jeff have done. Um, try to apply the Bluetooth TV Zapper Learn Guide to an IR Control Shield. Uh, need to build the IR Translator to let my Google TV remote turn off my Beamer. All right. Uh, and then next up is Jeff, so I will send it over to him. Hello again. So last week I finished the guide for the next keyboard, which is published in the Adafruit Learning System. We took a 10-year-old guide down for Arduino on a very classic keyboard and rewrote it for CircuitPython. Uh, that was a lot of fun. I continued the work on OS.ADNV, which has turned into a bit of a slog. I think we're seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. Keep you posted. I papered over a poorly understood Pico W bug by adding an extra one second delay at startup. Uh, I don't have a board that exhibits this problem, neither does Dan, so um, we went with a delay that we knew was safe and would get these folks running again. And I fixed a bug that could cause crashes at soft reset time on expressive boards by shutting down SSL sockets in a well defined manner. Uh, this week, number one is definitely getting the OS.getEMV wrapped up, and uh, then Katni and I will work through how to upgrade a guide that was using the .env, and then we will hand that off to Eva to get the guides that have been published thus far updated. And uh, then after that, I will get back to the other 800 blocking bugs. I have not picked out the next bug. Uh, in personal stuff, our 18-year-old Subaru's head gasket is failing. It's been our single car since our good car was totaled in 2021. Uh, somebody hit it while dr driving recklessly down the street, hit our parked car and totaled it. That was fun. Uh, and then found out that the car that we'd like, which is a Prius, has at least a six-month wait. Um, so we're on a waiting list at our local dealership. Hopefully we don't end up a zero-car family. It's not super easy in this city, but we're not 100% sure what we're going to do in the meantime. And that's what's up with me. All right. Thanks, Jeff. I got my fingers crossed over here on the car situation for you. Uh, next up is Katni, who was unable to make the meeting today, so I'll read. Uh, Katni says, last week, uh, put the iSpy guide into moderation. Uh, started the event countdown timer guide, which is a collaboration with Noe and Liz. Uh, this week, Katni says, finish up the countdown timer guide. Add a new board definition with a board.button for the latest revision of the Feather RP2040. Uh, and if this gets finished up, uh, next will be miscellaneous or other guide from the list, or both. Uh, so thank you to Katni for sharing some notes in here. And then next up is Paul Cutler, who's missing the meeting, so I'll read. Uh, Paul says, new episode of the CircuitPython show is out today with Tectric, uh, who shares how CircuitPython uses continuing integration and his CircuitPythonica project. Uh, and then next up is Scott. Hello. Um, so in terms of when I'm around, uh, I'm out on Wednesday to travel. We're flying back to Michigan where my wife's family is. Um, and then I'm working four more days, Thursday, Friday, Monday, Tuesday, and then the 21st, which is next Wednesday, I'll be taking off through the new year. Uh, I might try to do, well, if I have time, I might do some other stuff, but no promises. Um, and then I'll be back on the third with the meeting and uh, I'll work from Michigan Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and then we travel on Friday the 6th. So that's kind of my holiday plans. Um, before I go, before I stop working, my goal is to wrap up this ESP ULP testing and the, the API that I did. It's a rework of the Coproc API that was already added. Um, I'm pretty interested and excited about it. I've got some tooling now where you take a, a, a main.c file and it produces 
kind of a self-contained Python file that like loads the code for you and and does all that stuff, which is pretty neat. Um, so I want to get the PR baseline for stuff that for that stuff in, and that's blocking 8.0 because that's an an API change. Um, and then I'm going to port that tooling, uh, refine the tooling for the ULP, but I also want to reuse some of that for the Stemma G0 that I have, which is a kind of a Stemma coprocessor thing as well. Um, for the testing for the ULP, I need to make sure that Deep Sleep's not broken with it. Um, Deep Sleep on the S3 is currently broken because of the ULP just being enabled, even if though it's not used, so i got to figure out why that is. Um, so that's my main goal. Uh, and then two other random things. One is if you are using web workflow on the ESP, um, last week I fixed some responsive responsiveness issues. It was like pretty slow and kind of frustrating. And then I fixed the issue and it was like much nicer to use. So that was, that was great. That happened uh, early last week. Um, and then on the personal side, I have a backup computer here that has like lots of hard drives in it with data, and I was upgrading it to um, a new Ryzen thing because I had a spare motherboard and that it's not coming up and it's been really frustrating. Um, it like powers on sometimes, and I thought the memory was bad because it powered up without the memory in, but then I like went to plug in a USB drive with you know, some Linux on it so that I could get it working. And it completely shut down and now it doesn't power on again. Um, and I ordered like a new power supply for it. So it's got a new power supply. Um, so that's been frustrating and I don't have time to fix it before I go on vacation. So it's just going to sit here. <laughs> yeah. Computers. Always, I know, right? Always fun, but always work. Yeah. Yeah. Like if any, if folks have systems they use that just do it for you now might be the time that i'm most amenable to it so if you have suggestions for how to back up data locally and like remotely to another place uh let me know all right all right thanks scott um Thank next up and i believe yep rounding out our status update section is tectric who's text only this week so i'll read uh tectric says last week uh began some backlogged improvements and fixes for adabot uh, adding draft PR status to the PRs listed, announcing updates to the community bundle, uh, patching fix for the bundle creation CI, uh, appears to be failing for the community bundle, uh, worked on updates to the composite actions used by the library CI. Uh, those uh, updates to that composite actions were updating versions of actions like set up Python to current versions, uh, addressing deprecation warnings for steps in the CI, We'll bring those uh, fixes to Blinka and the core as needed. Um, Tectric also mentions mysteriously still doing uh, OK with the advent of code in C. Uh, it's pointers all the way down. Uh, and then for next, uh, next week, Tectric says, beginning to wind down as, as my grad course comes to an end with the final and as, uh, excuse me, to an end with the final and the holidays approach. Uh, please feel free to tag me if the CI breaks, and I'll be happy to spring back and fix it. Uh, working to close out relevant open PRs and leave it in a working state before disconnecting later this month. Uh, beginning to make up my uh, excuse me circuit Pythonicas. Uh, everything has arrived on time. Going to build them and ship so that they can arrive before the holiday. And that gets us to the end of the status updates section. Uh, so our fifth and final section for this meeting is uh, the In the Weeds section. Uh, in the Weeds is an opportunity for more long-form discussions that either come out of status updates or were identified ahead of time as too long for status updates. Uh, if you've got an In the Weeds topic, uh, please make sure they uh, get added to the notes document. Um, there is one here, so if anybody has another one in mind, please go ahead and add that while we're talking about the first one. Um, the first one that we do have is from uh, Microdev. Uh, I don't see Microdev in the voice channel, so I'll read this one out. Uh, but of course, folks can follow along with this in the notes doc as well. So, uh, micro oh, it uh, didn't read far enough ahead. It says missing meeting right there. So Microdev says um, they would like to discuss uh, this issue. I'll link that in the chat here as well. Uh, this is an issue on the core 455. Four, 4554 is the issue uh, issue number, yep. 
Uh, it was a suggestion to add count on alarm as a replacement for count IO. Um, it looks like the open question maybe is how kind of filling in um, based on shorthand, but I think the question is how should the API work? Uh, only adding countio.counter, which takes an alarm object, is option one. Add countio counter alarm and move sleep functions to sleep.lightsleep uh, and sleep.deepsleep. So option two was that one, uh, adding the counter and then moving the sleep functions. And then option C that's listed is add alarm dot count on alarm that takes an alarm. Uh, and I will really admit I don't do much with the deep sleep, so I definitely don't have any thoughts on that. Does anybody else have thoughts or ideas around this issue? Well, he didn't suggest alarm dot count alarm. So, you know, right now alarm has pin alarm and time alarm in it. So I'm not sure. Uh, okay. I don't think, I wouldn't replace count IO with an alarm because there are plenty of uses for it that don't alarm, involve right. alarming. People do use it to count things. I think I think it's I think we'll just follow up on this issue. I'd like to know more details about what they're trying to yeah. do. Yeah. And I suspect that actually the ULP could be enough. <laughs> like if you need something to wake up and increment something, uh -huh. like the ULP might be just fine. Nice. Um I mean they they obviously know that because Microdev added the first version. So, uh, yeah, I would just say, like, I looked at the issue and it's, it doesn't have a, a concrete example in my mind. So I'd like, mm -hmm. I'll just fall up there. Okay. Wait okay. For, wait for some more info there. All right. Yeah. Um, and that was our only item for In the Weeds. No new ones have appeared. So I will assume nobody has anything else, uh, which gets us to the very, very last part, the wrap up, which I will read over here. So this has been the CircuitPython weekly meeting for December the 12th. Thank you to everyone who participated. Uh, if you want to help support Adafruit and CircuitPython, uh, and those of us that work on CircuitPython, please consider purchasing hardware from the Adafruit shop at adafruit.com. Uh, as a reminder, the video of this meeting will get released on YouTube at youtube.com slash Adafruit. The podcast will be made available on major podcast services. Uh, it will also be featured in the Python for Microcontrollers newsletter. Visit adafruitdaily.com to subscribe to that. Uh, the, uh, as I mentioned before, the next meeting, next week's meeting on the 19th is at the normal time, 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific on Monday. Uh, the following week, however, this is your, your early uh, warning for that. The following week is the week we're off. And then the week following that is uh, when it gets moved to the Tuesday. So we've got a couple of changed uh, meetings upcoming after next week, which will be at the normal time on the 19th. Um, so keep that in mind. Get that in your calendar if you need. Uh, this meeting has been held on the Adafruit Discord, which you can join by going to adafru.it slash discord. Um, if you want to get notified about the meetings, please ask to be added to the CircuitPythonistas role. Uh, we'll ping that role whenever the meeting does change. And those notifications will still come for those upcoming uh, meetings as well that I mentioned. So um, thank you to everyone again who participated. That's going to be it for now. Thanks, everyone, and have a good week.